When all the deliveries walk in the door, it's it's all hands on deck. It's nice when these yeah, orders come in early because we can process the fish right away. Yeah, you because know, it's so small that you can't just have like boxes and boxes laying around. There's no receiving team. Two days a week are the market days, and um, usually two days a week are major butchering days. You know, there's always like the nuts and bolts, little things like herbs are picked every day, but the fact that there's four of us, you have to compartmentalize your projects and use the manpower the way that you can. We wanted to test two different fish today. Um, we'd been using black cod. We weren't happy with what we've been getting recently. We brought in Atlantic cod. It's good, I mean, it's really good. Um, and so this is rock cod. It's coming in locally. So we figured we'd try it, see how it ends up. If we have something at our disposal that's local, I'd rather use it. So basically we just take the fillets off and then I'll uh, cure the fillets. And then once they're cured, we'll milk poach it. Today across the board, like, I just butchered cod all day. Like, that's what I'm doing. Um, as much as I would love to say, like, oh, I get to do this and that and this and that, the reality is, like, today I'm the fish butcher. Today Randall's the meat butcher. Um, and tomorrow it'll be totally different. Once I process all these, I'll have the, you know, the bones on one tray, then I'll save all the innards on another tray, the feet go in another thing, the wings in another, and then the rest are processed separately. When we were looking at our menu structure, we thought, I don't want a menu with a bunch of short stories. I want to write the menu as one long story. So this is our winter menu. As things die and fall, because everything dies and falls in winter, it builds layers on the ground, right? Things are buried, things are hidden. And so the pumpkin seed course is the first one with this idea that, you know, all that's left on the ground are like seeds and twigs, and it's all very dark. You know, nothing fresh on the dish. The top layer is burnt parsley and fried pumpkin seeds. It doesn't look welcoming at all. And then from there, we move into a Wagyu course. We use the Wagyu as a wrapper and we filled it. Basically, everything's hidden. Everything's kind of tucked away. The general feeling behind the menu is that you can't see anything. The beef is hiding everything inside. You know, it looks kind of underwhelming almost when you see the dish. It's just like beef on a plate with some garnishes. Um, but all of the flavor is really kind of tucked inside. And so all of our menus, every course is something from the previous dish and something that'll be in the next dish with the idea that the courses are linked. We have passion fruit in the Wagyu dish, which is into the passion fruit broccolini. And from that point, we start exploring seaweed. Uh, yeah, so this is the side of hamachi. Uh, we're gonna break it down for the seaweed and hamachi course. Uh, we'll portion it into 25 gram portions. And this time your seaweed's awesome. The water's colder, the seaweed's really lively and crisp. We put it on the dish raw and we do it fried. Uh, the best way to fry these, because we want them to be bright green when they come out of the fryer, is you gotta fry it at 450, which is really high, really hot. So it kind of makes this crazy explosion, but it's the best product you get out of it. Grab a big handful of it, or a pretty moderate handful. Just pump got your nice green seaweed dulse. Come service, we're gonna sear it. Really, really hot and just on one side, uh, so we get the nice color, so it has the texture of raw. The hamachi is tender enough to cut with a fork, but I think we probably should give you a knife, with, like the average person would want a knife with it, but we chose not to because we want them to fight with the course a little bit. I think once you get a couple courses in, you get comfortable. And when you get comfortable, you kind of stop being as aware of what's going on and you're just kind of like a little more relaxed. And we wanted to have that be the point where we regain your attention. We interject a little bit of discomfort. After that, there's a course served on a spoon and that's the Yuzu Black Sesame course. And the idea with that course is now you don't have silverware. So watch the color change all of a sudden. So one of the things that we do in the menu is we'll often play this game of moving back and forth between savory and sweet. You know, I think it keeps guests not really predicting what the menu is. Then the sesame, it tricks you a little bit because it, it becomes questionably sweet. Like, is this a dessert section? Am I finishing? Like, this doesn't really make sense. Once it's cool, uh, we basically crush it up 
and we end up with this. And then that becomes the topping for the spoon. And it gets yuzu cream and then the Butterfinger over the top. So it looks like a spoonful of dirt. Now you don't have silverware. It's served as a bite on a spoon on the first plate that's shared between two people. So they, you know, they have to go for the spoon. Ultimately, they end up saying, which one do you want? You know, little things like that, that gets diners re-engaging with, with each other again. From that, you go into preserved corn that's cooked in brown butter and black winter truffles into probably the biggest lightning bolt dish in our menu, which is the caviar course. When I was portioning caviar for a previous menu, I was <laughs> drinking a Dunkin' Donuts French vanilla coffee. I was tasting the caviar as well, and the two were awesome together. The French vanilla coffee for me has always been kind of a cool winter thing. I grew up playing hockey, and my mornings were with my dad, you know, going to the game, and on the way there, we'd always stop and get coffee together. And it's literally like melted coffee vanilla ice cream. Um, you know, roasted hazelnuts and then a tea oil. Um, it's not like your traditional combination. I think whenever you describe it to people, they don't expect it, but it's probably my favorite, one of my favorite dishes we've ever served here. There's only three plates on the menu that are white, and the first of those is the carrot dish. We slow cook the carrot and miso for eight hours. It sits on the plate with um, peanut and a burnt Meyer lemon ponzu, fried carrot top and uh, carrot flowers with it. To the side of that, there's a small bowl that the diners share with each other. It has uh, midnight moon cheese that we've basically turned into cheese whiz. And then you get a third bowl behind it with little carrot fritters. So we thought, well, if we force them to share something and we don't really tell people how to eat it and just say, we encourage you to explore, then they have to talk to each other. So the cod, it's cured for about an hour. You see all the liquid that came out. I mean, all that came out of the fish. Ended up being a really nice texture. Look at it in the light, it's almost translucent right now. It's much tougher. Once it comes up to 65 Celsius, we let it sit for seven minutes, then pull it. Because what we're really looking for is for the fish to just sort of flake apart like this get nice big pieces to marinate. And then this is the lemon vinaigrette to dress the uh, cooked cod in. The idea is to not break it up too much. We let it marinate for 24 hours and that helps the protein seize a little more. Uh, on the bottom, we just took pork belly, smoked it, braised it, and then we make a riat. On top of that is the milk poached cod in uh, lemon vinaigrette. This is black radish. I would say for the most part, all of our dishes have some kind of raw vegetal aspect to it. And to finish it, olive oil, potato foam. It's not that we're trying to hide things, it's that we want each layer to kind of have its own experience with it, you know, that sense of discovery. We wanted to work with squab. We really wanted to, to do the whole bird. You know, we talked about putting the whole thing on a plate, we talked about presenting the whole bird first, then cutting it, and then the discussion became, why do we do that? Once they're all, once I have them like roasted, then I'm gonna throw lots of garlic, shallot, and thyme, so it's really, really flavorful. The more we thought about it, the more we thought, well, everyone's doing it right now, so maybe we shouldn't do that. And once I'm happy with the color, I'm gonna add three pounds of butter. So we had this thought of basically presenting the entire bird without actually showing the guests any of it. Once it's all melted and bubbling and foaming, I'm gonna add all this roasted squab back completely cover it and get the caramelization we're looking for. It's gonna make a very delicious squab jus at the end. Your first course is just served in a wine glass, um, and it's a squab and beet consomme made with the body. Um, and it looks like a glass of red wine. And so this is the second course of the three-part progression. On one side, a squab leg riette. On the other side, braised cabbage, pine nuts and squab liver mousse in the middle. I think that there's a duality to winter where when you're outside, you know, it's cold and it's harsh and then it all gets covered. It also evokes that feeling of comfort inside where people start talking about sitting around the fire and you know warm food and things like that. After that, uh, of course, with the uh, breast and heart. And the progression of all of those ultimately breaks down the entire body over matching plates that all ultimately show the guests the whole bird without showing them any of the bird. We start with a ragu of squab heart, beets and preserved cherries. Over the top of that, polenta, squab breast. And then we have the whole roasting process, the squab jus. It's finished with nasturtium pesto, and then we really wanted to sort of reflect the fact that at this point in the menu, winter's kind of coming to a close. And in the past, we've always talked about like, 
laying everything on so perfectly, but it's not really how things fall. And so instead it made more sense to just kind of let them be. So for the final savory, it's just coming back to life. The transition course after the squab into dessert is, is a salad and it's all the same greens that are on the squab dish, um, but it's all baby versions of those because the baby wild fennel is sweet where the mature wild fennel has a lot of salinity to it. Moving into the, the dessert, we wanted to continue with this sort of movement towards a lighter dish. Um, so we wanted to play off of sweet peas and olive oil. Some roasted Marcona almonds, a couple freeze dried peas, and then this is shortbread. This is an olive oil jam that we make and creme fraiche that we whip. Right now at the market, the pea tendrils are amazing. The idea as we move towards spring is everything starts growing. The sorrel's in it for a couple of reasons. One, it's growing wild everywhere right now, but it also adds a really nice vegetal acidity. A blend of matcha tea and uh, powdered peas. Right around four o'clock, we clear off all like the tablecloths and things on the pass, and we convert the restaurant into a restaurant. We start up the music and open the doors at 525 and guests walk in. The story begins and that's it. Off to the races. The original idea came from uh, the idea of a concept album. You know, an album that has to be played straight through in order, song five needs four and six. And I was really drawn into this idea of the fact that things made things better. Like it wasn't just a collection, it actually had to be. So otherwise you have favorite you know, favorite dishes, and then you have the dishes that fill the void. The big conversation we've had now about the spring menu is just this idea of growth. And so how do you make the menu look like it's growing as it built? Because that's what happens in spring. We've made it through, almost through the first seating. Guests are kind of winding down, moving into pastry. Um, and that's it, that's like, I guess our story. 